And thank you, Gary, for speaking with our group tonight. We are just uh, thrilled to have you and super excited to hear your stories. So uh, Gary Bauer Sox is a renowned worldwide as the gem hunter, gemologist and author, and among the top experts in the world on Afghanistan. Uh, he, um, he has extensive and long experience with government agencies and DOD and corporations asking for insight and consultation on Afghanistan and, cent and Central Asia. Um, he is, was the presenter and consultant for the Gem Hunter in Afghanistan 2001, a 50 minute television documentary film. I found it on YouTube, so I'll post the link here in the chat uh, uh, later on. Um, and, and he was also um, chaired eight symposiums on gems and minerals of the Hindu Kush and Central Asia. And he has authored two books, Gemstones of Afghanistan and The Gem Hunter, True Adventures of an American in Afghanistan, both available on Amazon. So Gary has been called a modern day Indiana Jones. And um, so he has had all kinds of uh, adventures and real life dangers, um, including he traveled, has traveled for months at a time on horseback, climbing narrow paths to mountain caves at altitudes as high as 14,000 feet. He was last in Afghanistan in April and May, 2021, and in, and in Tajikistan in May of 2022. So Gary's presentation tonight is um, uh, gemstone hunting in Afghanistan and Central Asia. And it will be a review of Gary's 50 years of research and travels in Afghanistan, Tajikistan, and other Central Asian countries in search of gemstones. So with that, Thank you very much, Gary, and give you the floor. Thank you okay, so much. Okay, thank you. Okay, are we, I guess we're a little technically, there we go. Okay, does everybody see that? Perfect. Okay, good, thank you. Well, I'm happy to be here and happy to see many faces that I'd seen several years before. We're starting off, as you know, when the Taliban took over Afghanistan at that point, that was my 50th year in, in Afghanistan. And was said, I was there just one month before the Taliban closed things down and basically caught everybody by surprise. And everybody had serious disappointments because friends such as my uh, chief of staff of the army was told that he couldn't fight, couldn't put up barriers. And so there was a lot of, of mishandling of what was going on and totally unsuspected by most people. Uh, the month before when I was in Panjir Valley, we were up until midnight most nights discussing uh, what was going to happen and how it was going to happen. And the plan was for the Tajiks, the Uzbeks, and the Hazaras to get together, which equal half the population, and they would fight against the Taliban taking over. But as it all happened, it happened so fast that uh, no one had time to put anything together. However, a lot of the equipment went out of Afghanistan to Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. And when I was there last month, there are plans, and there's been some serious fighting the last two months. And I just regard the whole situation as unstable and the Taliban have yet to been recognized. So I don't think they're going to be able to form a, a recognized government. So going on from there and jumping way back in 1964, three days out of college, I bummed my way around the world and haven't really stopped. I kept going right through COVID and it was pleasant flying because there was no one sitting next to me or in front of me or beside me. And I could rent a car in the US and, and drive across country. And it was me and the truck drivers. So, and for food, I'd 
drive up to an Arby's or a McDonald's and they'd hand me a sandwich and I'd sit in the parking lot. The hotels weren't allowing anybody in my particular room for 48 hours before or after. So it was the cleanest hotels I've ever had. However, now travel is a mess. I've had trouble getting flights back and forth. I had uh, just finished up working on a whole program for USAID when this all happened. And we had a symposium scheduled for the 12th of July in Afghanistan 2021 where we had people from Israel and about five other countries coming uh, to Dubai. And of course, it was the first time for the Israelis, and many of them were my friends that I'd known for 20 to 30 years. So they were all excited about it. And the Ministry of Mines in Afghanistan had just officially released about $30 million worth of emeralds and other gems for the foreigners to purchase in Dubai. So we had a major symposium uh, financed by USAID. They were paying the hotel rooms, not, not the travel. But everybody was all excited about it. And on the 2nd of July, we got messages that Dubai government said, because of COVID, please delay the symposium. So we delayed it till the 2nd of November. Now you know what's happened. Uh, we couldn't do it on the 2nd of November. So, however, news as of two days ago, I've just been hired again for a short contract to fly to Dubai by USAID. And we're having a, a conference there with several people. I don't even know who all is attending on how we can support the gem industry of <laughs> Afghanistan. Uh, some of you may not be familiar with the area, so I just put this map in. Uh, you can see Afghanistan in the center of the bottom north of there is Tajikistan and then Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan above that. So the great game of invaders is still going on. Uh, as you probably know, a short list is Alexander the Great was one of the first ones through the territory. Then Genghis Khan, Tamur, the Russians, the Brits, the Germans, <laughs> Soviet Union, USAID and NATO came in next. And then Pakistan's fooling in there now with sort of somewhat control of the Akoni group that's basically controlling the Taliban. Uh, China, Russia, and Iran have had meetings in Bagram and our base there. But to my knowledge, China has really stalled out signing any mineral contract contracts. Uh, we all thought they would jump right in there and go back on their copper and other things, but I think they can see a loss of money. And my hope in the long run, if they do get serious about it, someday the U.S. and the Russians can sit down and laugh because of all the money we've lost in Afghanistan and let China lose some money over there. But also sure. they've been working with Iran and there's been Iranians in Afghanistan of late also. Well, if you want to see what some gems look like, this was a picture that I took a year ago. About 15% of those have sold now, but these are mostly from Afghanistan, probably 85% of them. And I've talked to Jeff Post, who most of you all know, about taking the cat's eye aqua, which is in the center of this picture in February as a gift uh, for the Smithsonian to exhibit it at uh, the Smithsonian. Whoops, missed, whoops, missing pictures here. Sorry about that, going the wrong way. Uh, some of you may know we've got lots of mountains. We've got 20, 20 some mountains over 15 to 18,000 feet in Afghanistan. That's the hardest thing about traveling through the country. And here I am, this is 1984 with the turban on purchasing kunzite crystals in Bajor. I want you to know if you take trips that way, there are five-star hotels, however, and also there are decent restaurants. You just have to search them out. This is how I dressed on one serious trip over there because they weren't going to let me cross the border. Pakistan didn't like me, even though I had legal visas from Pakistan and from Afghanistan. Uh, they didn't like me crossing the border order to work with Ahmed Shah Massoud, who you see here in this picture, who was the commander in the north. 
Uh, they preferred Hek Matiar and some of the Pashtun commanders to Masood, and he didn't really get along with uh, most of them. There were lots of problems all during the skirmishes. In 2001, I had taken a film crew in through Chitral and into Badakhshan uh, to film the Lapis and the Emerald Mines. And uh, we this was our crew going in. This was the uh, night tra time traffic. This film, as was mentioned earlier, is on YouTube. And if you don't get the right link, just go to YouTube dash Gary Bowersox and it's free. It's a 52 minute film that was done by a basically a BBC crew. And it was sponsored by Austrian and German TV. They spent $500,000 to do the film. Most of that had nothing to do with the Afghan side of it. It was fixing it up later, but it was, it's a pretty good film, pretty documentary. In 2009, uh, World Bank and then later USAID hired me to put a crew together because they wanted to know and have more knowledge of the emerald mines and the ruby mines in Afghanistan. So this crew went and we went to each of the mines. And at that time, we were hoping that they would be able to give miners licenses, which they have not done to this day. But the first, they said it was impossible to give out mining licenses to people in the mountains that didn't speak English. But I th hope that we proved them wrong uh, by taking GPS systems up there in each hole or tunnel we would take the GPS, getting the latitude, the longitude, the altitude, and the miner's name. And we plotted these on, on maps for them to use for licenses, whereby you'd blow it up on a computer. But when the man himself went to sign the license, he'd have a two-page license with an agreement and a copy of the mine at a, at a scale that would fit on the, the paper. Uh, what, what we found... Uh, was that, uh, this is Panchir Valley, by the way, I got to switch around here so you can take a look at that. That's where the emerald mines are. This is one of the side valleys. There's 65 side valleys to Panchir. I'm diversifying my story here a little bit because I thought I had another slide coming up first. But anyway, uh, that mountain goes up to 17,000 feet on the right-hand side and 16 on the left. And when the Russians tried several times to attack, they failed. And then they tried to bring gunships, their hidden helicopters down through these valleys. Well, they had trouble getting up at the high levels because of the altitude. And the, they would get up at, uh, well, sorry, it's jumping on me. Sorry, going back. Uh, they would, uh, they would shoot down the Russian helicopters from the tops of the mountains because they were up above the helicopters and they hadn't learned to armor plate the top of their helicopters. The next step was the Russians tried to just go in and pull and blow up the area and the mines and the villages. And they ended up finding emeralds in the bomb pits on many occasions. So they gave up because they were financing Massoud at that point in time. This was their group sitting in a, a field, getting ready to climb up the mountains. And this was some of the satellite maps that were produced later uh, after we had all the coordinates of all the mines. And you could see there's large gaps in between the mining areas. And this is just the emerald deposits in, in Panchir Valley. So we also found that there were many spots in between these er areas that had emeralds and emerald production. So we're nowhere near depleting these deposits at all. And this was a, a map that's now on the internet. Uh, USGS has formed this map, which was better than anything we had to work with. But they also have a hyperspectral data that was paid for by World Bank, a lot of it US tax money. and. Uh, <laughs> We never were allowed to use any of this. It's been developed now for over 15 years. What we wanted to do was take it and, because it's chemical analysis, and match areas where there was beryllium 
with chrome, because chrome's what colors your emeralds, and see if we couldn't develop other emerald mining areas within Afghanistan. This is what the villages look like today. And if you see the article on the left, uh, anyone can go to my webpage, uh, which is the Gem Hunters, which is plural, gemhunters.com, and you can download these articles. This one's on the emerald mines of uh, Panchir Valley. Here's a look at some of the emeralds that you see here. Here's a fine, clear emerald from Afghanistan. So it's got quality comparable to any Colombian. And the only edge that the Panchir has is they have a lot of crystals, much larger than the Colombians. We found many clear crystals up to an over 100 carats in size. Uh, this horse is a 70 carat. If you can look at it and see it's a head of a horse, that's a copy by Uli Pauli of Alexander the Great's horse, Bucephalus, which was ridden all the way from Greece to India. And the horse became famous because it was the only horse in the initial battle that stood up against the Indian army because they were on elephants. The other horses tended to run away. And it became so famous that there was a town in Pakistan, which was India at the time, named after the horse. And if you look up uh, wines, you'll find there's also a Bucephalus wine, yet today uh, sold by the Black Stallion wineries in California. So what we found at the end of our findings as far as the emerald mines, that there were 290 active mines and over 1,500 miners working in the mines and uh, several millions of dollars being produced each year. However, one of the major problems of Afghanistan to make the whole industry legal is the bakshish system because you try to take a bakshish system, which means people are collecting fees up and down the line directly from anybody that wants to do anything, I guess you could say, whether he's got emeralds to sell or emeralds to mine or <laughs> ex export papers, et cetera, you have to pay some bakshish. And this is what gem sourcing people don't like and also created a serious problem until the Minister of Mines, uh, just before the fall of the Taliban, uh, was willing to reduce the fees down to where they were practical. Because without that, the all duties and fees and, and fees and taxes were on top of the bakshish system. So for instance, just to give you an idea, if a policeman charges a car that's driving by a fee, that doesn't just go in the policeman's pocket. It goes all the way back and up to the chief of police. So it's a whole system that uh, I think <clears throat> I give the British, so if you want credit or not credit, whatever way you want to look at it, for it was built in India during a time when the Brits didn't run to want to pay a lot of money to the Indian laborers, but they were willing to turn their backs if they wanted to collect money from their friends for permission to do about anything. So that all started way back in the 1800s. <clears throat> this was <clears throat> in, uh, we're missing, I guess, part of my, anyway, the date on this was May of 21, and I'm about to go up to the 14,000 feet to the top of the mountain in the background. And I think that may be my last trip to the mines. Uh, Shahik, my best friend, who I worked with his grandfather, then his father, and now with him, and he's in his 30s, we uh, had a situation where I said, well, I don't know if I can really make it because I'd had my 82nd birthday, but, uh, but I'm willing to give it a go. And he said, no problem, we've got horses in the village. And he and I have ridden horses all over Northern Afghanistan. But when I got the horse in the village, I went about a hundred yards and you may or may not know, but Afghan horses don't have saddles, which means they don't have stirrups. And my knees aren't what they used to be riding basically bareback. And I was in the horse 
once we hit some altitude, he's jumping over boulders like you see my foot on here. And I'm sliding one way and then the other. So I told the Afghans, I'm either going to eat rocks for lunch or I'm going to get off this horse. So I got off and needless to say, then I had to climb. So I made it, but boy, my timing was not world record at all. <laughs> This is what it looks like at the top at the 14,000 foot level. Whoops. I guess I'm shooting a thousand feet on this picture. This was 13,000, but we did go up higher. <laughs> and this is inside one of the tunnels, which is hard to see because no proper lighting, but they were mining and mining was quite active at that time. As of uh, this last week, there is some mining still going on and still some production. Now I'm going to jump you to the ruby areas. This was a 32.32 carat ruby that was found several years ago that I brought back and, and have finished and, and sold. Here's a 100 carat ruby rough. Um, so good crystallization in this case. And the ruby mines go back to the 1800s. And this is what the ruby crystals like. The mountain is all marble. And then you have the crystals within the marble itself. So people set and pound marble all day long in Jigdilic, Afghanistan. This is a look at it from a satellite. It's actually a bowl. You see it, it's going from the right-hand side to the left-hand side of the picture here. All the mines are contained within that natural border area. And some of the areas are quite deep. It's all trench mining and very few tunnels. Some pictures here of what you've done. Also, here's a copy of the Ruby article that was done a few years ago. And again, that's on my website. If anybody wants to go and pick it up, you're welcome to download it for free. Another Ruby tunnel. And this was the maps we came up with in the Ruby mines that, from our group. Uh, so there's a lot of mining going on and there's still production as of last this last week. I still have contact through Zoom with many of my minor friends and we we talked and they are still getting production. Now we'll jump to Nuristan. This is where the tourmaline and aqua or yeah tourmaline, aquamarine, morganite are coming from mostly. Here again you've got high mountains, villages and uh, tough territory here. This is where Alexander the Great came through and all his troops got poison ivy and they got drunk because the Nuristanis make a wine. Somebody asked a question? Okay, here's another one. And I'll tell you a quick joke, one of my favorite ones about Afghanistan at this point in time. There was an American jeweler that got very tired of dealing with customers and working with the public and moved up into these mountains and built himself a little mud house and uh, was there about a month. And all of a sudden there's a knock on the door and he opens the door and here's a big tall Afghan standing there. Most of his teeth are missing, his clothes are all tattered. And he speaks a little bit of English and he says to him, he says, you know, there's wine here in this valley and I'm having a party Friday night. Would you like to come? And the jeweler said to him, well, I'll consider it. But, you know, I came up here to get away from people. And Afghan says, well, you know, there's going to be some good wine to drink. Then there's going to be a big fight. And then there's going to be some good sex. And the guy says, well, let me think about it. But if I decide to come, what should I wear? Oh, the Afghan says, don't matter. It's just you and me. <laughs> okay, as far as Nuristan. Uh, this is the gems are coming out of Nuristan. It's an aqua in the background. We've got kunzite, tourmaline, and morganite. Those are the main stone. Some garnet, but not really clear garnet. And this is the one that I told uh, Russell, because Jeff wasn't there when I was at the Smithsonian this last month, and I told Russell I'd donate because it was better than anyone they had in their showcase. It's 586 carat cat's eye aquamarine. Now let's talk about lapis for a minute. Uh, lapis, as you all know, goes 
way back over 7,000 years where it's been traced to Mesopotamia and Lapis was taken on into Egypt. And it took three years, according to stories, to get to Egypt where they made the Pharaoh's face mask or death mask, I should say, made all kinds of statues, made scarabs that they used for their business seals. Cleopatra powdered it for eyeshadow. Later in history, Michelangelo and all the painters powdered it for their blue paint. A little bit of knowledge behind that. Now the Getty Museum has done a study, and I went to each of the 10 lapis mines and brought back samples, and they were testing with a some high powered machinery to determine which painting had which lapis from which mine in there, in their thing. This is one of the lapis trade routes, as you can see here, going back to 1600 BC, starting 2500 BC. I'll leave that on just a second so you can look at it. This is what the tunnels look like. They're up high started about 11,000 feet and they're quite deep the old tunnels and you'll, you can see them in the movie that we mentioned that you can watch on YouTube this is what a lapis vein looks like here's a piece of lapis that I purchased recently just to give you an idea that that piece weighed uh, 10 kilos or 22 pounds and I've got it priced at $1,900 so lapis price is actually down from what it was during the old days. These are two fancy pieces recently carved by Daryl Alexander. I've also got a lapis tabletop. If anybody wants to come to Y, I'll serve you dinner. Now let's look back. Uh, doors open and doors close throughout history and who knows what's gonna happen in the future as far as Afghanistan, but ancient times, they went all the way to Egypt with the lapis and Alexander the Great came in, actually married a woman from Tajikistan. And the Mongol period, Genghis Khan and Tamur controlled a lot of the territory. Then the 1800s, 1900s is when Russia, Great Britain, and later Germany, which was interesting. Germany was sort of the last one to come into Afghanistan. But then during World War II, the Russians, Great Britain, and the U.S. ended the picture and they forced Germany back out of Afghanistan just politically. There was no fighting there. And then in a the modern period, we have US, Russia, Pakistan, China, and Iran all fiddling in Afghanistan. In my opinion, the future, we're gonna see at least a year to two years of instability, but actually fighting has already started in the North to kick out the Taliban and they're not really being recognized by any country. So I just go back to what I'm saying at this point in time, I regard it as totally unstable. They don't have the talent or the money to run a government. Uh, you can read the stories going back in my book, Gemstones Afghanistan. And this is a brand new picture just a week ago by uh, Vince Perdue, he's in Afghanistan at this point in time. This is Kocha Valley, where the lapis was found, and it was famous for centuries for the lapis. However, halfway up that valley is a place called Padua, and they're now finding spinels there, and spinels have reported in Zo Valley in the south. This is a picture of the spinel production which is current. This is all within the last six months. Now we're going to jump stories as Spinels because I'm working with GIA to write mine or articles on the ruby mines and the Spinel mines of Afghanistan. And of course, most of you have seen this crown recently at Queen Elizabeth's funeral. Uh, that's a Spinel thought originally to be a ruby in the center of her crown. Uh, and also there was another major piece with uh, called the Tamur Spinel that goes back, goes back 600 years. And that's this piece here, which was in the 1400s, Tamur carved his name in it. And so did other rulers after him, as you can see the list in the bottom of the picture. Now, what was interesting 
with this piece is when I went to write the book, Gemstones of Afghanistan, was that other pictures of the queen and the crown were British owned. However, Queen Elizabeth personally owned the Tamir Spinel, and that doesn't give you rights to publish anything to do with the picture or anything about it. So I had to go to England, went to the British Museum, talked to the gem people there, the FGA people, and tried to get information and how I could publish this photo. Well, the museum went in the back room and gave me this picture that you see here. And by the time I got back to Hawaii, I had a very abrupt letter. Don't you dare use that picture for anything, no matter what. And so I started on the phone. What can I do? I want to publish this in my book. And they said, well, we don't know what you can do. And finally, someone says, well, talk to the Queen's jeweler. So I finally, after about two weeks, got the telephone number of the Queen's jeweler. And he, he literally laughed at me. He says, I'm no attorney. He says, I can't give you permission for the Queen to do anything. So then I got the message and finally got the hold of the Queen's barrister who is basically an equivalent of an attorney in the United States. And of course, like other attorneys, the first thing he said to me, he said, I've got a question. I said, what's that? He says, are you an attorney? I said, no. He said, well, I really can't talk to you. You'll have to get an attorney to talk to me. Well, I said, but just tell me, is it possible that I can get permission to publish this picture? And how long will it take? And he didn't give me an answer. And this went back and forth with letters. I'm just trying to get an answer to those two questions, which I couldn't seem to get. So we got down to three weeks before I was to either take this picture out of my book or to publish it. And I sat down one afternoon and hand wrote a note, dear Queen Elizabeth, I've really frustrated. I really want to put your spinel picture in my book and tell the tale of it and uh, a week later i was able to get this letter back from buckingham palace giving me full permission so the moral of the story it pays to go directly to the top at times and uh but i think i got the museum in a, a bit of trouble because they said they weren't supposed to have the picture in the first place in the letter so so now we're going to jump to tajikistan this is i was there two months ago and working on these stories and i'm probably the only one in the group listening today that had a kgb man and two russian scientists buy him dinner uh, and they were quite friendly however you'll see the bottom line at the bottom of the picture in black that's where kuilau is the spinel mines and there's fighting going on in the border uh, both with the mujahideen in afghanistan and some Tajiks, but there was also a riot going on with students, Tajik students in the area. So the KGB was not allowing anybody to go down there that didn't live in the area. And also they wouldn't let me go way out to the west to the Murgab ruby mines, which are on the border at this time. So I've postponed that trip until next June, hoping things will get better. But anyway, they were very nice to me. And uh, my story coming out of there because Chinese people were on TV every night speaking excellent, excellent English and telling how the Russians were killing people and the Americans were killing people in Ukraine and were basically bad people. While they were going into Tajikistan and the other stands offering funds for building materials and building their Silk Road and uh, just wonderful Chinese people. And at this point, I it was told that 35% of the Tajik debt is now due to China. So maybe this is going to be another story like Sri Lanka, where later China tries to go in and foreclose when they can't pay their debt. So how did I find those mines originally? I started back some 20 years ago. Uh, a friend of mine had a book, one of the original Marco Polo books, and I actually found this. Well, there's Marco Polo, supposedly. It was on Time magazine, so I think that could be fairly accurate. But I found this map, which Ural had 
retransposed in his stories on Marco Polo, which he translated. And actually it says uh, mines right down there. Uh, I can't point it out. I don't have a pointer to show you, but it's actually on the mine. If you can pull this up and stop it later, uh, you'll find it. It says mines. And this is a Danish explorer by the name of Ole Olofsson, who was a captain in their army and also an explorer. And he wrote also Kuilau on this map. So these Spinel mines, we know go back to 101 BC. Captain John Woods was another explorer in the 1800s. And so interesting with John was he was afraid to get caught with any paperwork, so he would take beads, the strands of uh, Muslim beads, and he would count beads as he walked or traveled in different areas. Then he'd recalculate later how many beads into a distance and put that in his reports as he reported as a British spy back to the government. This is what the mine basically still looks like today. However, this week I had, you see more tailings here, this was sent to me by a friend who's a satellite expert, satellite software expert, I should say. And so this is a, a map that was taken last week or a picture from satellites of that mining area. Of course, the problem going to Tajikistan is you have to get all kinds of permissions to go anywhere over there. And you're stopped constantly on the road, wanting to know what you're doing, why you're doing. And of course, they try to give you or take a bribe from you at the same time. Uh, my Tajik friend has was said that they even found some policemen out on the road in uniform actually weren't policemen at all. They were poor, didn't know how to make money. So they went and purchased a policeman's uniform and would start on, stand out on the road and take money. So I'm pointing at the actual mine, which is along the Pine Jia, the old Oxus River that you see here in this picture. There's another picture of it with a village just down below. This is the actual main tunnel going into the mine, which goes a couple hundred yards in into the area. And you note there's a train track there. Well, we took a train cart into the mine, but the battery stopped and we had to walk back out in the dark, but we did have some lights. Here's a, a picture of a chipped off piece of uh, mother rock that was, that was given to me by Ollie, who was in this picture here. He was the geologist for the mining area and also the manager. And interestingly enough, for years I'd collected reports by Roskowski, Lev Roskowski, who was a famed uh, mineralogist in that area and taught it, it was a professor at the university and he knew Gene Ford. Some of you may know Gene uh, from USGS who passed away years ago. Well, Lev, uh, years ago was writing to me, wanted to become one of our people after the Soviet Union crashed, and he was allowed to leave for Israel. But my major problem was not only was he Jewish, he was Russian, and I couldn't get any visas for him to come to Pakistan, which was the only route we had into Afghanistan at the time. But anyways, it ended up, Ollie here, was a, one of his students. So we got along famously and Ali was willing to take me into the old tunnels. And it was reported there were 408 old tunnels uh, traced back to at least 900 years. And they say originally it went back to 101 BC. And here's a picture of a Russian map of that same mountain. However, going into this tunnel, as you can see here, the people in the old days were much larger or smaller than I am. And my sides were hitting the edges of the tunnel and it was caving in. And you'd go four or five feet inside and then there'd be a tunnel to the left, a tunnel to the right, and sometimes one up and one down. And we went through about eight to 10 of these tunnels and I had lost my sense of direction. And as you can see, I'll leave piled rocks up to the side each time we made a turn. And I, I said, well, at least you've got a long, unless you have a long rope, I'm ready to go back for tea because I don't want to spend the rest of my life in these tunnels. 
And at that time, Ali said, yeah, there were a lot of people that did that because we found a lot of skeletons in these tunnels. And some of them actually opened up into small rooms as you would go in. So going back to the spinels themselves, this is a map of or design of a necklace that we're looking at making. If anyone's interested, let me know. <laughs> This is the road going out now to the ruby mines way out north. Uh, once we got to Korg, we had permission to go to the ruby mines. This was in 2006, this particular picture. And uh, we got into the village and we went to see the village chief. And he told us, uh, your permission is no good. We don't want you going out. You may just be a spy. This was to me and my Tajik friend. And so we were really disappointed, didn't think we were going to be able to go. Went down to the market to get some lunch. And down in the market, a fellow walks up to us and frankly said he was KGB and worked in that area and wanted to know what we were doing there. So we told him. Uh, that we were hoping to go to the ruby mines in Mergob up on the Chinese border. And he said, well, would you mind coming and talk to my boss? And so we went into the office and his boss was kind of in line with the village chief saying, no, you guys shouldn't go out there. It's, it's dangerous. There's people out there that we don't know and don't trust and this and that. And we said, well, we really want to go. So anyway, after having tea, we left the meeting and went back and decided we, the only thing we could do was prepare to go back to Dushanbe the next day. But we went down the next morning to the bazaar and the same fellow was down there. He says, you know, I had some classes in, in geology and I don't see any picture of any problem taking pictures of going to the ruby mines. So why don't you come back and we'll talk to my boss again. So we went back and once again, he served us tea and he was much more friendly. And he said, I don't see a problem with you to go out in that area. And I said to him, well, you know, the problem is the village chief doesn't want us to go. And I don't really want to end up in one of your local prisons. So would you mind calling him? And he said, oh, okay. So he gets on the phone. And I remember my days seeing uh, Brezhnev in some meetings when he all of a sudden turned red and started pounding a table. And that's exactly what happened to this KGB chief. And then he slammed the phone down and he pointed to me and my friend. And he said, you two, you let me go know anywhere you want to go in this country and I'll fix it up for you. This man said I had no power and he was ticked. So we ended up going about 200 miles on this road and we came across a barbed wire area with some guards in it and some buildings. So we stopped and got out and I showed my passport to one of the guards who was holding an AK-47. He said, oh, Mr. Gary, come on in. We have food, no food area, no house. You stay here tonight. And uh, so he did take care of us. So it was a good story. This is getting up into the mining area now. This is how the miners live and are still living today in these, uh, looks like railroad cars actually, but they're just built huts. And this is up at about 13,000 feet in the Morgab Ruby mining area. This is their cook stove. Everything's done with wood in the area. Although when you look at pictures, there's very little wood in this area. And we were served uh, Marco Polo sheep and watermelons brought from the village below. They claimed that there was about 500 Marco Polo sheep living in the area. The mines are all trenches again. This is about 1,500 feet and it was cold, even though it was the beginning of August when we were there. Ruby crystals, we've had ruby crystals extremely large. This is 1,100 carat crystal, which I have some cut stones from, not clear and clean in this case. However, we did have these dragons produced by Uli Pauli in Germany, who's a fifth generation gemstone carver. And this was the best ruby to come out of the lot of the stones that I purchased. Uh, the story behind this 
is actually a purchase when years ago in 1999 uh, from a miner and brought it back to the United States, had it cut by Andy Gulick in San Diego and sold it to some friends in Dallas. I paid 15,000, they paid me 23,000 and they passed away three years ago and their children who I knew well called me and said, well, they wanted to sell their parents' stone collection. Would I buy it back just for what I paid for it? And I said, well, your dad was a deacon in that big Baptist church in Dallas. So I certainly don't want to just buy it for your cost because if I ever try to go to heaven, your father's probably not going to let me in. So I paid him a, a $7,000 profit on it and took the stone, showed it to Jeff at the Smithsonian and took it and showed it to Gem World people and several other dealers. And uh, today, that stone is probably worth about $140,000 because rubies have gone up considerably. However, if it were Burmese, it was estimated to be over 200,000. And Ted Tamilis in Thailand says that's gemological racism because it's the same material as a Burmese ruby. And it's a Tajikistan ruby, it shouldn't be knocked down that much. But anyway, I sold this stone last February for $90,000. Now, why can I go through Afghanistan and Tajikistan like I do? Well, there were many years through Rotary Clubs, we collected money and I took school supplies to the schools up in the mountains as far as 100 miles out of Kabul. For the, and here's my wife and I passing out school supplies in one of the schools. And uh, by the way, we did girls classes as well. And another side note, this was the only trip my wife was willing to take to Afghanistan. She let me know within a week of being there, that was her first and last trip to Afghanistan. <laughs> she was having trouble with the, uh, the cl cleanliness of the country. And of course, once you get out of Kabul, there's no bathrooms either. <laughs> Uh, also, the Lions Club had a program of collecting eyeglasses through the uh, drug stores and other places. And so we took free eyeglasses to Afghanistan and passed them out on four different four different years. So people that had no eyeglasses and had poor sight could uh, finally see. And you'd be surprised at the number of older men that said they hadn't seen the mountain in two years and could now see it now. So we made a lot of points with the Afghans. Another thing we did is we had geology and gemology classes that we held. And uh, please note, we had women in our classes too. We had to do some pulling of strings, but they were allowed to come and they were very good students. So I've written the book, Gem Hunter uh, of Afghanistan, which is still out. And we have the documentary film that I've talked about. But Afghanistan today, and I should say that I just last week, actually four days ago, signed a contract with USAID to meet a group of people in Dubai on the 15th of December this month to start discussing how we can help the gemstone industry of Afghanistan. So I don't know what's gonna come out of that meeting. And obviously as this picture don't designates, we have a few bridges to cross. Well, now I've given you a short talk and I want you to know that maybe you think it's be 6,500 years of history, or maybe I'm trying to sell you gemstones or maybe better yet, I'm just trying to sell books and DVDs, but that's not true. I want to sell you, and you have the first chance to have a timeshare lot in Afghanistan. So here's my wife and I and here in Hawaii at the beach, and you're welcome to come over. And as I said, I'll make a dinner for you at our lapis table and visit. you can visit our brand new penthouse. So I'm making lots of money. And that's the end of the show. So let's take some questions. Anybody there? <laughs> well, thanks, Gary. That was fantastic. I feel like I've been on a, a trip to Central Asia. <laughs> well, you you know the group. You could you could pass a letter around if anybody wants to go. 
<laughs> right into <laughs> Afghanistan. <laughs> So are you, I, I know you were here on the East Coast this past fall. So are you, do you have like a circuit that you do or when when do you think you'll be East Coast uh, next time? Or DC? Um, US, USA is in Washington, D.C. So I don't really know, but I suspect I'll be back there according to my schedule, probably in May. I. I tend to start like I've got a show I know in Las Vegas in March and then I'll come across country, but I don't really know what the results will be of this meeting in Dubai. So I maybe do do some other traveling and I'm definitely going to Thailand and Sri Lanka this winter as well. But, but if I had to pick a date, it would be be next next May. I would be in Washington. Okay, well, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, touch a base with you and see how how it worked out about Dubai. Okay. Well, maybe by then you can have a live meeting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would be nice. <clears throat> so, Gary, question for you. I, I heard um, that uh, for a long time, the Afghanistans didn't really have the proper mining equipment and that they were uh, damaging a lot of their minerals with the exploding uh, the dynamite and that they were fractured and that they were trying to get better mining methods. Have they succeeded in getting better uh, equipment in there? Yeah, they've gotten a lot smarter now. Uh, they've, they've even got some uh, tractors up in the, in the mines that they took helicopters and brought up and so, uh, and, and I've learned they've learned a lot about blasting. Of course, they they uh, stopped using dynamite. Most of their material now for blasting is fertilizer, the nitrates that they're using now. And they've learned how to work it better. But it's still they do some damaging. But you know, a lot of people say, "Oh, you shouldn't use blasting." But you you can't work in hard rock mines. Oh, sorry can't work in hard rock mines without doing some blasting to get rid of some of the overburden. It has does nothing to do with gemstones or you'd be there forever. So. Yeah. Thank you very much, Gary. That was outstanding. I just, uh, you obviously can tell you took yeah, our was, breath away. Camera, you know, and, uh, we mm. just, uh, I'm, I'm just blown away. Anyway, I've traveled a lot uh, to places that are kind of off the beaten track. So I really appreciate what you put into that. Um, my question is um, about, you know, 10 years ago, the lapis uh, stock in Tucson kind of dwindled. Uh, and then about four or five years ago, the last time I was there was in 2018. There was a lot of it. Uh, do you think the prices are going to go up again because not much is coming out? Or well, they're, they're very, very low. Actually, what happened is Global Witness went in there and tried to stop the mining, saying it was illegal, it wasn't properly sourced, it was leaking to the Taliban, it was leaking to the Pakistanis, and they kind of made a mess of the situation, which which I didn't appreciate they had, because, you know, if their report only talked to one side, I, I told them to go talk to Commander Malik in the north who was running the mines at the time. And he did it all during Masood's time when he was there, but they didn't want to do it. There was always two sides to the picture. Uh, and, and the Badakshis called the government people thieves and the government people called the miners thieves and there was total disagreement amongst them and the at the time you mentioned when the price or the purpose became scarce was because they did stop the mining for a while and that was because a relative of the interior minister had been given the rights to the mines and they they took it away from the afghans in the mining area so that stalled things out for about a year and then lapis production came back up. And right now there's lots of lapis in the market in Peshawar, Pakistan, and as well as Kabul. So, but uh, the price is down from what it was back in the old Russian days when the Russians were there even. 
Really, thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, um, Gary, can oh. go, go ahead, Cameron. <laughs> um, I have a quick question. Uh, these are from Afghanistan and my boyfriend brought them <laughs> from Kabul. Do you have any idea what this green one is? Is this one lapis? There, there, there's a form of nephrite jade there, and I guess that's what the green one. The other one I'm pretty sure is lapis. Yep. Because you've got the you can tell because you've got the iron pyrite and you've got the calcite white material in it. So very yeah. cool. Thank you. By the but way, the, this is so they awesome. won't they won't hatch either one of them. By the way, I was hoping for dragons, <laughs> <laughs> but it's been like so long. <laughs> Nothing's happened. Thank you. Yeah, you probably haven't been sitting on them long enough. I know that's true. I haven't kept them warm enough. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> now, Gary, can can you talk a little bit about those uh, those uh, tourmalines from the Paprock area and Nuristan in general? Uh, how do they actually? make their way out of the country basically through pakistan and actually uh we did a seminar i brought our seminar we did a tucson show with afghans brought over by usaid and uh they kind of stopped some of the nuristanis because pakistan isi has gotten involved in the nuristan area logar area and they want all the production to come to pakistan so in many cases you'll see it's it's labeled as Pakistani tourmaline, but it's really not. Uh -huh. But it's a it's a soft weathered pegmatite area, and there's lots of it, and there's still tourmalines coming out. And if, if I have my choice, we'll be coming back with a newsletter here in a couple months, and we'll actually be showing pictures of current production of what's coming out. I think those are the most beautiful tourmalines I, I think i'm just i think those colors are just amazing with a little bit of yellow in some of them and the shades of the pink and the green are just outstanding yeah well not only that i've had them up to five different colors in one stone you know it's very very interesting but uh, the mint green is really popular too they don't they don't have some of the deep reds like brazil but they're still very reddish on some of their stones but, thank you but you're welcome Do you know if they have any Paraiba colored tourmalines there? Say, say again. In Brazil, there's a Paraiba tourmaline. It's kind of a turquoise color. No, we don't. They have don't it. have enough. Uh, what is it? Chrome? Yeah, chrome, I think, to make the copper. Uh, copper. Copper. I'm sorry there. OK, you're right. It's the copper. So uh, they have a, a mint green. It's close, but uh, not a true fluorescent color. Right. Thank you. Hi, Gary. My name is Steve Johnson. I actually uh, had been over there myself. I spent 14 months in Kabul and they got to go back uh, uh, three times on visits. Uh, clearly, I was in the military and I had one contact who uh, um, I bought from regularly in our, our Friday bazaars. We had a great, great young man. And um, probably the best rock I have is he had gone up to Panshir, uh, and he didn't bring me back any emer emeralds, but he brought me back one of the court scenes, mm. the emeralds out of. And I, I kind of like, you know, I my degrees in geology, so I'm a rock guy as well as a mineral guy. So it's like, and he was thinking of me when he went. So that's very special to me. Um, but it's more mineral related. What do you know? I, I, what do you know about the Chinese work in what is it, Bamyan, or the copper mining? Oh no, Ms. Aznak at South, okay. South of okay. yeah, yeah. They're they're stopped right now. They they had just started up or trying to start up, and they were out of they ran out of water, and the Logar people didn't want to give them water, so that was a major problem. But then at that time, they also had discovered major Buddhist villages in the area, so it totally got stopped the whole project. And they've got probably three museums full of artifacts now of uh, Buddhist artifacts. And but the Chinese had plans and they were talking seriously, especially after the Taliban took over of going in and starting up that mine. But uh, I think the Chinese, the last two months from what I hear, 
don't really want to give them any cash. And that's become a problem. And they haven't had agreements. And secondly, there's problems with the Uyghurs up in the northern St. John, China, and the Taliban have refused to try to stop any communications between the groups. And so the Chinese are mad at them because of that reason, too. But the, the plan was, when I was told, was that China wanted to build a railroad even down through the Wakhan, which is extremely high, and come in with mining equipment and take out all the raw material. And of course, probably would bring in some of their own labor and totally control the mineral resources of Afghanistan. But at this point, it's not happening. <laughs> Anybody else? Um, there's a question here, um, Gary. Um, where are you in Hawaii? I'm in Honolulu, right one block from the beach right now. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> are you going to Tucson this year? Oh, oh sure. Yeah, I'll be there. I quit. I quit showing, as you know. If you're a Tucson fan, my booth was the time I paid for my booth and for all the equipment and somebody to help me stuff. I was getting up to eighteen thousand dollars a month and just selling some of my nice pieces and come home without a profit. <laughs> and, uh, so it wasn't worth it. But I I'm going every year. In the last two years, when I haven't had a booth, I ended up selling more than I did when I had a booth. So. Dollar wise, <laughs> so, but I've been to Tucson more than forty years straight. <laughs> By the way, my email, if anybody has any questions later, is just Mr. Gary seventy seven at aol com. Repeat M R G A R Y seven seven at aol com. Do we have any more questions for Gary? I guess I shocked him. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't really a question, then. Uh, but just this afternoon, then um, and Jeff Post uh, from the Smithsonian, and for anyone and who doesn't know him, um, uh, um, was uh, the speaker on Mineral Talks slide. Um, um, it was a a, a, uh, a fascinating thing. <laughs> Jeff got frozen in time. <laughs> Another shock. <laughs> I have a I have a non question. Can you hear me okay, Gary? Yes. Okay. Um, I read someplace where you done your start really in about 1974. Um, in, uh, um, in, in in the uh, Gem and Mineral you know, Hall, you no, know, uh, um, well, be, behind the Gem and Mineral Hall at the museum, um, and uh, um, showed uh, showed off some of the the uh, gems that that he had right there with him, and and uh, so. Yeah, the most fascinating one, did you see the 40 carat spinel from Tajikistan? They just required that. So I'm going to put that in my article of G&G. &G, so. <laughs> Gary, is the geology of the ruby mines the same in uh, Afghanistan as it is in Mogok in Burma? You, you know, I've got to go back and do more work on that. So I have to that I'm finishing up the Spinell article, but I can't do the uh, Ruby article until we have more sampling. So, but I would guess it's close to Bungar because, you know, India is going underneath the Eurasian continent. So if you just draw a line across the top of India, you're going to connect it with Burma and Kashmir and, and those areas. So it's suspected that it will be, but there could be some changes as well. Thank you. I'd like to try the, my question again, relative to your, your beginnings. Uh, 1974, uh, you met a student uh, in Hawaii, and his father was the head geologist at the University of Kabul. 
Does that ring a bell? That's right. Yeah. Okay. So, so basically, what I'm interested in is you have a vision of what was what was going on in Kabul 1974. There was a king and a queen. They had invited people in from the, the West, so to speak. Uh, University of uh, Wyoming brought a lot of uh, their faculty and the families there to help about farming and also about mineralogy. And of course, that's all now basically gone in terms of the whole vision. So over those 50 years, um, an earlier part of your slides said that you've seen things come and go. <laughs> I wonder what that's like for you to have seen, you know, and have those personal relationships with people, not just your friend who was with you on all these travels, you know, and who's your translator and guide and such, but also the relationships with the academics, which are, you know, what's, what's that like for your vision of history? Well, it already is. The last few years, it's gotten turned around. We're going backwards. You know, I mean, King Zire Shaw, as you mentioned, uh, tried to get too modern too fast, according to the mullahs. And that's why that a coup happened with Dawood. And uh, they lost um, the modernization at that point. And actually, they have women, his uh, niece, I think it was, was wearing a mini skirt in Chicken Street downtown. And that, that got a little things a little bit upset over there. But uh, I, you know, my personal prediction is this current government, if you want to call it that, won't won't last too long. Uh, and I'm hoping we can go back because the rest of the world has always fooled with Afghanistan one or the other. Not always good, but I think they'll be back in there again uh, because the U.S. doesn't want to be totally out of that area. And Russia and China want to take over, and it's it's, it's just a con continuation of what they call the great game, and I think it's going to continue. And there's enough Afghans now that have high educations and are very intelligent, and, uh, but they got off base, and, and it ended up being a very crooked situation as far as the government and the people who are running the government. Uh, it wasn't for the people. Thank you. Gary, do you see a way for a good resolution within, you know, I don't know, I don't know whether it's my lifetime, our children's lifetime, what happens? I do, you... but it's going to take some some, uh, like, uh, some bad times first, you know. Uh, uh, right now, head of the Northern Resistance Group is Ahmed Shah Massoud's son, who is British school, military and political science. And he's a sharp young man. And he's got a lot of Masood's older buddies, I should say, or who were in different warlord positions, if they want to call it that, around him. And they all uh, have an idea that they can actually build a democracy. But I don't know if it'll happen or not. Uh, it's, it's a tough situation to do it. And, and the other problem is money-wise, they have to be supported because they have no tax system. So they have no natural income. So it's up in the air, but it, it, it as I, I keep going back to, it's totally unstable at this point. So whatever it is today isn't going to last. I have a question. What did you think of Charlie Wilson's war with Tom Hanks? Uh, say again. I didn't get that one. The movie, Tom, Charlie Wilson's war with Tom Hanks. Oh. What did you think of it? Well, the only complaint I had, because I went to Charlie Wilson's office one time and none of those women were there. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Charlie Snavel, Charlie, well, he saved Afghanistan with the, the cruise missiles. But it, it one time also caused me a problem because I wanted to cross the border. And of course, they never wanted me to work with Ahmed Shah Massoud. So I ended up having to wear a burqa to cross the border in the middle of the night because of uh, they put the Pakistani army up on top. But the, the secret I knew is that uh, an Afghan or even a Pakistani man could not talk to an Afghan man's wife. So I wore the burqa, which is totally facial covered and, and got through at two o'clock in the morning. So, <laughs> And they claim Bin Laden may have done that same thing too. Oh. <laughs> hey Gary, this is Steve Johnson again. If you're if you ever do develop that timeshare uh, concept, uh, <laughs> let, me, let me know because I just I mean, e Kabul, just that you know, having spent 50, 
no, 14, 17 months of my life there. Um, it was just the most pleasant environment. It really was, except for the, the, the situation. The people were, were generally wonderful. And the, the, the climate and the terrain wraps, I'd, I'd buy a timeshare there in a heartbeat, given the <laughs> right political climate. Yeah, I totally agree. I I just love, love the people. Sadly enough, I've got a few hundred that would like me to help them more get visas to get out of there. And, and my hands are totally tied. There's nothing I can do. But they, uh, the situation would be ideal if they could ever have a democracy. We could have ski resorts and everything else. And as far as the people, I spent, as I mentioned, this was my 50th year last year. And I have never been turned down knocking on a door at seven o'clock or eight o'clock at night saying uh, I need to have some food and a place to stay. And uh, you felt like you could stay forever up in those mountains. And Marco Polo wrote about the same thing in his original scripts that the Afghan people were so hospitable. So, yeah. Uh, I think it's it's possible, and uh, you know they want peace. Needless to say, nobody wants women treated like they're being treated now, and and fighting going on, and friends and relatives being killed, or the threats on their own lives. So, no one wants to live like that in the whole world. Gary, coming back to Lapis, I just wanted to have your opinion. Uh, you know, there is so much of it and it's um, really beautiful material, but is the pure blue without any other color in it the highest end or is it the more rare? Is there any kind of Lapis well, that's more rare than the common? Well, the rare is that super blue, dark, with almost a lavender shade to it. Okay. But the other side, there's a 50-50 argument between gem people even, because uh, Plato wrote that you should be look like the night sky with the iron pyrite and mm -hmm. the calcite. But iron pyrite and calcite to most people is a included material. So that's not pure lapis. So in Europe and many of the Afghans believe that should be just that pure, Royal blue without the pyrite or the calcite in it. So another comment uh, for Gary. Uh, if you have it pure blue, then don't you have a problem with uh, sodalite and lapis and telling the two of them apart? Well, you can send it to the GIA as a quick answer. Yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <separate>, real easy. Because <laughs> having the pyrite and the calcite mm. is what I been told it's the way you can tell for sure that yeah. you have lapis. But I've I've never on the upper quality I've never seen that okay. uh, purplish blue tone, you know, almost reddish. It's, yeah. Okay. And okay. and also some of the very best stuff almost clinks like a glass if you hit two pieces together. It's uh, because it doesn't have the calcite and the pyrite in there to stop the sound, I guess. Okay, well, I guess I'll say aloha. <laughs> Thank you again. That was wonderful. You're welcome.